Good morning, everyone. Well, yeah, good afternoon. I guess I'll call yep. but, um, Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Stephanie Lynch, and I am the Industrial Hygiene Product Manager here at OHD in Birmingham. Um, and let me get my screen shared. I just realized you might want to actually see the presentation, huh? Okay, there we go. So I'm the Industrial Hygiene Product Manager here at OHD. We're in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, I'm joined here today by our marketing manager, Justin Lobdell. Uh, say hello, Justin. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Justin will be monitoring the chat and letting me know if there are any questions or comments. And please do feel free uh, to drop those in you know, anytime. Uh, I love to have a little bit of interaction as we move through the presentation. It makes me feel like we're almost in person. Yep. <laughs> <A little bit. laughs> Absolutely. Um, so here we go. So hopefully if you're here, uh, and you're interested in the components of a noise monitoring program, then you're aware of what sound is, but just to kind of brush up on the basics. Sound is caused by pressure fluctuations around a static pressure. For example, uh, I'm pushing air past my vocal cords, that's causing them to vibrate, and that then is gonna cause air molecules to, to move and transport energy. Uh, that energy in the form of vibrations is then picked up by our ears and of course, ultimately interpreted as sound by our brains. Uh, the requirements for sound, like for the physical definition of sound to occur, these first two elements listed here uh, must happen. So we're gonna have to have a source, of course, and then we're also gonna have, that source is gonna have to have a path to follow. Um, so as an example, there would be um, no sound in a true vacuum like space. So it needs at least something to travel through. Uh, when we define sound, though, from a psychological view, uh, which we are in this training, then there must also be that last requirement of a receiver for that sound uh, to be perceived. So for us today, that's, you know, ours and our employees ears, right? So this gets us on to one other little note that can be a little bit confusing. So often sound and noise are used interchangeably, but so technically sound, sound is objective. It's a physical thing. And this is different from noise in that noise is subjective. Um, it is the perception that's associated with the stimulation of your um, you know, auditory system. So think of that old philosophical question. If a tree falls in the forest and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Well, um, based on this distinction, it makes a sound, right? However, there's no noise without someone there to perceive it. And for the purposes of this training, we're only gonna be considering those sounds that we and our employees hear and how they subsequently impact us. So technically noise. Um, so I'm sure that's very clear, right? Makes sense. <laughs> Another way of thinking of it is that noise is unwanted sound. So you'll hear that quite often as the distinguishing point. So another important aspect is a basic understanding of the terms that are associated with both sound and noise. This diagram is showing a really simple sine wave we saw this uh, briefly on the first slide too, although hopefully you got to see on that first slide as the graphic moved along, kind of the compression and the, the you know, decompression of the, those waves as they're moving through a medium. But so most sound doesn't actually occur as a simple sine wave, but this illustrates the concept as that sound wave is moving through whatever medium like air. So the amount of molecular, molecular movement up and down is going to be the amplitude. So the way, the distance that that wave gets from that center line, that's gonna be its amplitude. Um, and then the period is the duration of time in one vibration or cycle as it's measured in seconds. And the number of these vibrations per second is called the frequency. And we all should know that that frequency is measured in, in Hertz. So, um, are you able to see my mouse, Justin, when I come up here? And yes. Okay. Yes, so cool. So when we go from, from one starting point and we go until it crosses again back the other direction, this is going to be one oscillation. 
And that oscillation uh, is how many times, uh, or is that basically how you measure those hertz? So 200 hertz is equal to 200 of those oscillations per second. And, you know, 2000 hertz is going to be equal to 2000 oscillations per second. And so that's just that one complete wave when it gets back to that center line. So when you monitor noise, you're going to be looking at values in decibels. The decibel in normal use, uh, when people probably just, just throw it out, they're referring to a degree of loudness, but technically it's a unit used to measure the intensity of a sound by comparing it to a given level on a logarithmic scale. So most popularly, the way to describe the magnitude of sound is with its sound pressure level. And then due to the wide dynamic range of sound, it's easy to, easiest to do this with a logarithmic scale. So the reference level for sound pressure level is the pressure threshold of hearing. So the point at which we can, we can hear. Anything below this, we wouldn't be able to hear. And this is just kind of going into it a little bit deeper. So that base level here is this hearing threshold that I just mentioned. And it's also the reference sound intensity for decibels. So when you divide this given uh, sound intensity by the base reference level, you get the sound level in decibels. So when you take this and you're dividing it by this, you're gonna get that, that 10 there. And then um, moving a unit of distance along that scale means the number has been multiplied by 10. So as we work our way up from 10 to 20 decibels and so forth and so on. And so the only reason we're doing this is so that we can work with more manageable numbers. It just puts that giant scale into a more manageable way of discussing it. Okay, so we talked, we touched on frequency for just a second, but this is where it becomes really important like for our purposes because sound is not exclusively characterized by that sound pressure level. A very important characteristic is its frequency. And the sound's frequency, as I mentioned, is how many times per second that sound pressure <coughs> wave is repeating itself. The frequency of the wave is going to define the pitch of the sound. Uh, it's a representation of those number of cycles per second that the wave is repeating. And it's, it's gonna, it bears repeating that the unit of that, so the unit of frequency is hertz. And so um, I don't think I mentioned this last time I used the examples of 200 and 2000, but maybe a, a better way to conceptually understand that is that one hertz would equal one cycle per second. So a wave that finished the cycle in one second would be a frequency of one hertz. So in general, low frequency sounds are going to be perceived by us as bass-like. And so we have some examples here. I hit the high frequency first. So our high frequency sounds are going to be perceived as that very high pitch. And I actually, I don't see where I can minimize this now. Sorry guys. So that was our high frequency and our low frequency sound is gonna be the one that's gonna be perceived as very bass-like. So that low frequency sound is not going to have as many cycles per second as that high frequency sound. So subsequently, that low frequency sound is a longer wavelength and a high frequency sound is a shorter wavelength. Um, just as a note, you may also see, uh, that that's what I have here with the 10,000 Hertz. You may see frequencies of 1000 Hertz or above represented as kilohertz, you know, where appropriate. And that, that's really, again, just trying to make numbers um, be on a more manageable scale. So noise measurements often include a wide range of those frequencies. And to provide frequency specific information about a noise, that can help in our ability to design noise control measures. So like our, our barriers, our enclosures or um, acoustical tiles, uh, you actually could come up with a, if you didn't look into your frequencies at all, and you just thought, I'm just gonna build an enclosure, you could 
build an enclosure that could actually amplify that noise, even one with the top. It's not about just having that barrier. It's about the barrier being made of the appropriate material. And this is where um, some exploration into your frequencies can be very helpful. It can also help with the selection of your hearing protection devices. So this is, this is where these octave bands come in. Octave band analysis is concerned with measuring both the volume of the noise in the environment and also the frequencies at which those noises occur. So single octave band analysis, analysis may, um, may be insufficient to, um, to resolve, you know, provide insufficient resolution for what your problem might be for some of those purposes. And so the next step is third octave analysis. So, and those are the ones you'll see most commonly, the one to one and one to three. Um, but this can go all the way to, to one twelfth. So depending on your purposes, if you were, um, you know, needing to, to identify the acoustics for somewhere that's, that's meant to play concerts, you know, you might have to get very deeply involved in how these frequencies are working. I'd say in general, that's not what we're doing, but it can impact you, right? Something about the design of your facility could be uh, impacting how, how frequencies are traveling within your space. And so this can help you identify which frequencies are the problem and then therefore go into how you solve them. Hopefully that makes it sound a little easier to deal with. So why do we care about these noises and ultimately monitoring them? We first off, of course, want to protect the hearing of our employees. Uh, Helen Keller, actually um, you know, a famous Alabamian, uh, where, where we are, uh, said that her blindness was what separated her from things, but it was her deafness that separated her from other people. So I don't want to get too sappy here, but once you lose your hearing, uh, it's gone. And then you're left sitting in a room filled with people talking, you know, maybe your family, and you're not part of the conversation. So there's an important just aspect of that, right? And I'm not saying there are things, you know, of course, people have um, hearing aids now and there are things you can do, but it's not, it's not the same. Uh, I just remember my grandmother, we could be in a restaurant, particularly if we were out in a restaurant and there was some sort of background noise. Um, she just wasn't able to participate in any sort of mm -hmm. meaningful way with anything that was going on. So it is important. We do want to provide that health protection. All of us should be protective of our hearing. Uh, there's also an important aspect of job satisfaction that can come from noise monitoring, and that's kind of twofold. So when people are exposed to noise, even that which isn't harmful, it can be just very annoying. So you can increase job satisfaction by reducing the actual noise exposure, because people do definitely find it uncomfortable when noise is too loud. But uh, you can also do that by simply monitoring noise because you're, you're showing that their exposure or annoyance is important to you. So does that, does that kind of make sense? So it's those two different levels where um, you're showing your employees that what they're saying, even if they're just coming to you about something being annoying and maybe it's not actually harmful, then by you investing that time and monitoring it and showing that in and of itself can contribute to their job satisfaction. Okay. So monitoring can also give you indications of maintenance issues. Uh, and then, of course, the big one is going to be compliance. Mm -hmm. A lot of times there are even standards that we have to um, abide by for maybe community noise now or environmental noise impacts. Uh, and so we just need to, to get some compliance, right? Sure. And then, of course, if your facility is over um, a threshold, you're going to have to do compliance. Mm -hmm and a lot of other efforts too. Okay. In noise monitoring, your noise is going to be divided into three groups. So you're going to have continuous, variable, and impulsive noise. Continuous noise is going to be defined as a noise of a constant level uh, with a duration of at least one second. And then variable noise is noise which varies in intensity and in durations exceeding one second. And then continuous noise uh, can also be variable. So, you know, getting a little, you know, adding a little confusion there, but impulsive noise has a duration of less than one second. Uh, also, you might hear impulsive, uh, you, you'll hear the word impact noise. And the only difference there is that impact noise is object to object, whereas impulse, impulse, impulsive noise is that like that comes from a 
for cuts like an explosion or a gunshot. Um, okay. So there's also different weightings that take place with noise measurements. So noise monitoring has time weighting, uh, fast, slow, and impulsive. And these are another thing that are simply defined by the standard or the regulation, uh, whatever you're, you're following. And these determine the so-called um, speed at which the monitoring instrument responds to a change in noise levels. So an instrument set to fast will respond quickly to changes in the noise level. And an instrument set to slow will respond more slowly. If the noise level is constant, both of those instruments are gonna display the same level. And an instrument set to impulse will respond very quickly to an increase in the noise level, but it's gonna take much longer to fall when that noise level decreases. And so you're gonna select this based on whatever regulation you're following. Uh, and there is a lot of work being done now <clears throat> that um, states that maybe us using the slow response for a lot of our compliance uh, is not uh, as helpful as we might have previously thought, but there's an, a large expense to changing that. And I'm sure you might've noticed that sometimes our government's a little slow to, to do so anyway. Mm -hmm. So uh, as of right now, just make sure you know which standard you're going by and follow it. So there's also frequency weighting. The human ear is capable of responding to frequencies that range from 20 Hertz all the way to uh, 20 kilohertz. However, the ear is gonna be, our human ears are much less efficient at both high and low frequencies. And so we're very sensitive in the range of 500 Hertz to um, 4,000 Hertz. And that range is generally considered the range of speech. So that's kind of um, touches back onto when I was talking about the importance of it. So as well as being the area where we're most sensitive to it, as far as just being able to hear it and perceive mm -hmm. it, it's also where we're going to have damage first. So that is really going to be the first thing you're going to lose is an area within that range of speech. So a weighting mimics that sensitivity. So noise monitoring instruments have frequency weighting to account for that. So you're typically going to be looking at the A filter when you're concerned about um, the human exposure. C weighting is gonna place more emphasis on low frequency sounds. This is most commonly used in um, applications uh, like community noise monitoring uh, and environmental noise monitoring. And that's again, because you're kind, of, you're kind of breaking outside of the box of being only concerned about the human exposure. And then Z, is used when you want no weighting applied to the noise. Uh, and so I listed up there is zero weighting. Uh, I actually don't think that's what it stands for, but that's what I've always used to go, you know, Z filter, zero weighting. Mm -hmm. So this is just gonna help us look at this A weighting and why it's important. So A weighting, as I mentioned, is what you're going to be typically monitoring when you're looking at human exposure. So just to understand that, these are all the exact same pressure level. So that's a pure 100 hertz sound. And then this is a pure 250 hertz sound, both at the same pressure level. And so I just wanna point out that you should be seeing like a difference. Do you hear how much louder that is sounding? So that was a pure 440 hertz. This is a pure. Based on my level of annoyance at that one, we're going to skip. <laughs> we're going to skip this yeah. last one. Uh, but I, I hopefully you were able to see um, where it got. It sounds so much louder to us, but that's all the same pressure level. Okay. So the good news about all of that heavy noise knowledge that I just dropped on you um, is that the instrument is going to collect all of that for you. And now very often um, that instrument can collect the different uh, options simultaneously so that you're able to go in after and pick and choose what maybe you needed for your purposes. 
So typically the first step in noise monitoring is to know what your noise levels are. Uh, you just need to know uh, what settings are best for you in your situation. And like I mentioned, that may be even something that, um, so, you know, don't, don't panic about it because you'll probably have the option within your reporting, your um, software to go in and mess around if you think that you were viewing maybe a wrong setting initially. So that's why you just need to know what type of noise you're working with and which weightings you either need to apply or view uh, to achieve your monitoring goals. This can be as quick as spot checking your loudest space uh, or as involved as noise mapping your entire facility. Uh, oh, and just in the interest of full disclosure, OHD is now the proud sole distributor of the Svantec line of noise and vibration monitoring equipment. Uh, so that's what you'll see here and that's what you are seeing here. So that's us. <laughs> So sound level meters are not typically what you're going to use for um, compliance measure, measurements when we're looking at um, human exposure, but they are what will be used to identify a problem. They can be, are be used uh, to select the appropriate controls once a problem is identified, or they can be used to identify um, maintenance issues with equipment. Um, they're also now what you can use to do uh, continuous monitoring uh, of a facility if maybe you're concerned about community noise or environmental noise. Um, and so in that case, those are what you're then using for compliance, but specifically with compliance concerning your, uh, I see that someone raised their hand. Is that, I don't know if I just saw it on the screen. So I didn't know if you want to just type a question in the chat, but Justin, I'm sure can tell me. Uh, whatever your question is, if you yeah, want to pop it sure. in the chat, um, is do I need to pause? No, Are there any questions? No, okay, we're good. okay. So, ideal, like for instance, in an ideal world, um, you would have performed baseline measurements on any new or existing uh, piece of equipment, and then you might check regularly to see if there's a noticeable change, and that change can end up being indicative of something you know, really small, like a loose screw uh, or a bad belt. And the sound level meter can help you figure that kind of stuff out. So, you know, if you just had unlimited resources, you could have monitoring outside of your facility to make sure you're not exceeding any of those community or environmental noise standards. And then you could also have uh, monitoring within your facility around some of your um, problem equipment to make sure it doesn't have maybe just a maintenance issue that's creating uh, a vibration and noise problem. So this uh, is just something that comes up with the sound level meters, whether you need a class one or class two, and that simply defines how precise the meter must be and which meter you will need uh, will depend on, you know, what you want to use the meter for. So um, what noise you want to measure, uh, what, measurement regulations you need to meet, and then also whether or not you have reason to believe that those um, measurements will be used as legal evidence. So for instance, if you want your measurements submitted as legal evidence, then you may prefer to use that class one um, device just uh, for increased accuracy. But so this, you'll just be able to see that it's just a matter of that drift away from the center line. So your class one meter is gonna hug that line more closely. And then that class two meter is allowed a lot more drift and that drift widens. Uh, so just as an example, um, I talked about you know meeting a regulation. So um, if you're working to an environmental noise standard, then it may just specify that the instrument should be class one. So um, I know that one example that we get is the unintended monitoring of aircraft sound in the vicinity of airports, which is covered by ISO uh, 2906, I believe. Uh, that just requires that you use a class one sound level meter. So if that's something that you need to do and that's what you need to meet, then you're going to want to use that class one. But um, the 2005 uh, control of noise at work regulation simply requires that class two. Uh, and, you know, class one is going to be able to do everything that the class two can. It, these have all the same design goals. It's just about that um, 
precision. So class one is considered a precision instrument. Class two is going to be considered more of a, a, a general instrument. Okay. So now that you just know everything about sound level meters, mm -hmm. do, do you have, <laughs> um, and hopefully something about the settings you need or the data you'll at least need to view, you can go out and perform some preliminary no noise surveillance. So remember that that is area monitoring. And so with area monitoring, location is everything. Uh, make sure to consider things like reflections off of yourself if you're planning on being the one to go out there with the, the monitor. And then uh, think about vibration off of the surrounding surfaces. Also remember the purpose of whatever measurements you're making and you know, measure where is then practical. For instance, if you're concerned about the noise levels in an area where people are working and you're concerned about their exposure, there may be no need to measure behind the equipment where if no one works there, right? Be, be responsible with your time. You're worth it. Um, so noise dosimeters are technically just a specialized sound level meter, but these are worn by the worker and they measure their personal exposure. They're very light now and can be easily worn all day. Um, some, there's a lot of consideration that you're going to have to, to make there, but uh, this is again, where you place that meter. I think the OSHA says within two feet of the head. So that's going to dictate kind of where you're going to place it. Right. But so whether you or not you perform personal monitoring is going to um, depend on several things. So if area monitoring reveals a possible noise ha hazard, or if you just want uh, more indiv individualized data, that's when you're gonna make that move to personal monitoring. Um, you can, uh, from a legal perspective, uh, perform monitoring with a sound level meter to establish a person's exposure, but that's only if they're not moving around too much and there's not significant variations in the sound levels and they're not exposed to any impulse noise. So as you can see, that becomes a very narrow range of when it's appropriate to use a sound level meter for personal monitoring. So the noise dosimeter is what you're going to be using for personal monitoring um, and mostly for compliance. So that's uh, compliance with regards to human exposure. So this is going to be what's more appropriate. I think I just mentioned these things, but on how mobile the employees are, whether the areas they work in have significant variation with those sound levels, or if the employees are exposed to impulse noise, it's going to allow for you to do individual exposure, and it allows for you to monitor over the entire shift. And it's also going to provide you, of course, the highest level of accuracy. It would be difficult to be particularly accurate with the use of a sound level meter, um, just setting it up kind of near someone, right? So this is gonna be your best option if you move to personal monitoring. So noise dose is going to be what you're really most concerned with when you're looking at personal exposure. So noise dose is directly related to the standard that you're referencing. And, you know, I just keep saying that. So this is why it ends up becoming very difficult uh, if someone just throws out a question of, um, you know, what's best for me at the police department? Well, you know, that's going to require us kind of diving in a little bit into what you're actually doing and what's, you know, is there a standard you need to meet? Well, let's, you know, let's dive into that standard together. Let's see what it's requiring. And then let's weigh that against all of the considerations that are um, personal to you and to your, uh, your workplace. So it's a function of how much time noise dose is going to be a function of how much time you spend at a sound level as compared to how much time is allowed by that standard or regulation. And um, kind of the next couple slides will help hopefully clear that up a little bit. So this kind of helps explain that and then how big of a difference it can make. Because if you notice, so this is the time you're allowed to reach the 100% noise dose based on, and here we have listed the NIOSH recommended exposure limit or the OSHA permissible exposure limit. So as you branch away, what's happening here is that NIOSH is using a three decibel exchange rate. So every time the noise goes up, 
by three decibels, the allowed exposure goes down by half. So you'll see from 85 to 88, you're going from being allowed eight hours of exposure at 85 decibels on an A-weighted scale, of course, because that A-weighting is uh, reflecting how people are impacted by noise. And then you, when you go up to that 88 decibels, three decibels away, you go down to only being allowed four hours of exposure. Now, if you look at OSHA's recommendation, the only difference here is that exchange rate, which we'll touch on later just to explain a little bit more, but they're using a five decibel exchange rate. So they're going to allow you 90 decibels of exposure uh, on an A-weighted scale, of course, again, for eight hours. But as you go up to 95 decibels of exposure, you're only going to be allowed four hours at that level of exposure. And that's how you're getting your noise dose. So your dose is directly related to whichever recommendation or um, standard or regulation that you're following. So this kind of just dives into that a little bit more. And this is also where the benefits uh, of measuring on multiple channels starts to show. So this is the OSHA PEL and then the OSHA hearing conservation settings. These are very common in um, noise dosimetry. They're common to be just preset on uh, really all noise monitoring equipment, but particularly for your dosimeters. But there are certain aspects of noise monitoring that may have you wanting even more channels. So keep in mind that when we comply with OSHA, that's the bare minimum. And so I put the ACGIH and NIOSH. Um, so it's ACGIH's um, TLV and then NIOSH's um, recommended exposure limit that we saw in the last slide. Uh, and it might confuse you why we would want to measure on that scale. Well, these settings follow more closely with how sound actually behaves. And also nearly a quarter of workers exposed at OSHA's allowable limit still experience hearing loss. So that's one out of every four people who are exposed to what our, uh, you know, permissible exposure limit based on OSHA is, are still getting hearing loss. And once you drop that down to um, the 85 criterion with also the three decibel exchange rate, you lower that significantly. So it's about that hearing protection. We want to do it because of that. And then also just the, the fact that it's, it's reflecting more closely how sound actually behaves, which we'll see on the next couple of slides. Quick, uh, quick question, real quick. Yes. We have time. Um, so, under OSHA's hearing conservation, could you go into more detail about that that eighty five dB fifty percent and and that and that actual limit? So, this is a pretty confusing thought because technically ninety decibels being a hundred percent dose is reflective of an 85 decibel exposure being a 50% dose. But um, it's just where you're getting that limit established. So if you hit the 85 at 50 and you were following the OSHA Pell, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have hit the limit. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the hearing conservation, it's going, uh, it's a, a little bit more um, conservative. And so you're going to have hit that limit. So at that 85 decibels of exposure is when you're actually going to be um, required to implement a hearing conservation program. Whereas just generally speaking, the permissible exposure limit overarching is that 90 decibels at a, as a hundred percent dose. Does that clear it up at all? Is it about as clear as mud there? Sorry about that guys. No, thank you. And if you have, if, if I don't, if you don't feel like I've addressed your question well, then please do feel free to email me. I'm sure our contact's on the end. And, Absolutely. Um, I'd love to have those kind of conversations and that's, that's what I'm here for. Uh, okay. So I was mentioning that uh, this is just the way that sound actually uh, behaves more closely. So, um, the exchange rate is the increase in noise level that corresponds to a doubling of that noise level. So in noise, 85 decibels plus 85 decibels does not equal 170. It's going to actually equal 
88 decibels. And that's why um, I pointed out that that three decibel exchange rate is more accurate. And now, so OSHA uses that five decibel exchange rate. And I genuinely believe that this may have been done simply to make the math a little bit easier. I think that people work in fives more easily than they work in threes. And so that's my defense of what OSHA's done with, with why they did it. Uh, it was also implemented, you know, quite some time ago. So um, maybe that wasn't even well a well-established fact mm. at the time. So could be a lot of reasons, but so that's the reason that you might want to go to using either ACGI, ACGIH or NIOSH um, because it's going to be more accurate and it's going to be more protective. So this is uh, just to show y'all that it, it's not even as straightforward um, as what I just said, because the difference between the two levels that you're adding actually dictate the amount that you're going to have to add to the higher level exposure. And I'm not going to go through an example of that because it's not going to be important to you in your noise monitoring program, really, but just so that you understand that it's not as straightforward as, um, as even how I put it with the 85 plus 85 equals 88. There's not going to be a lot of circumstances, right, where you're going to have 85 mm -hmm. plus 85 probably, but this is how they actually end up needing to be added. And it's based on the difference between the two sources. And the most that you would need to add is when they are um, the closest in that sound pressure level to each other. So that's what makes it even you know, more conservative, mm -hmm. ACGIH. Okay. <clears throat> so it's important that we also uh, look at some of these terms you're going to see on your noise monitoring equipment. So that LEQ is the equivalent continuous sound level. And this is the most commonly used value uh, to describe sound levels that are going to vary over time. LEQ is a level that would produce the same sound en ener energy over a stated period when you're using that more accurate three decibel exchange rate. So LEQ is always based on an exchange rate of three. For other exchange rates, the average level for the measurement duration is known as the L average. And, and so in the US, that exchange rate defined by OSHA that we just talked about is the five decibel exchange rate. So that's going to show you that L average. When you're looking at your equipment and you're viewing the you know, OSHA profiles or channels, you're going to see um, that L average. Whereas if you're following the ACGIH or the NIOSH and you're viewing that channel, you're going to see that LEQ. And then when that eight hour average level, so basically when these, either of these hit eight hours, that's going to be your time weighted average. So you're going to see that a lot too. So your time weighted average, um, I realize now that this slide is actually a little bit confusing because it, it makes it look like it has to be at that five decibel exchange rate, but this was just that example. So using the five decibel exchange rate, the eight hour average level is going to be known as the time weighted average. Uh, time weighted average can also be reported following that three decibel exchange rate. But of course, for our um, typical compliance uh, purposes, we can just look at this one example with OSHA. So it's the amount the worker is, you know, exposed to, um, expressed as an equivalent eight-hour workday. Okay, let's actually take a brief pause here. We have, um, well, Justin, why don't you walk through what we're going to do real quick? Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, let's take a quick pause. Um, and like Dr. Lynch stated before, um, I think we understand that everyone's, um, you know, situation and environment is, is unique to them. Um, so we want to, you know, best, um, help you guys in any way that we can. So we're going to, we're going to take a quick, um, poll real quick, just to get some better understanding of if you're needing our assistance. So keep an eye out on your, um, I think that unfortunately now, am I just, is that showing up there? <laughs> it is not. So do you want to? So just two seconds. <laughs> well, 
Well, it actually looks like it's going to take a second just to um, get the poll up. But so I'm going to just cover this slide while Justin's getting the poll going. Um, so after you set up what you want to measure, these are some of the actual physical steps. Uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list. And when you look at this, um, a lot of it is going to seem intuitive, but for the first several noise surveys that you do, I highly recommend that you bring a checklist. This is going to be in addition to the information that you'll collect as part of record keeping. You know, this is outside of your um, uh, data analysis within your software and any reports that you print. You um, want to make sure that your checklist is including things like um, checking your batteries, bring an extra dosimeter or two uh, just in case, you know, maybe one didn't, wasn't set on its charging dock appropriately. Um, Pre-calibrate. And then make sure to replace your, your windscreens. Um, that's actually just a pet peeve of mine that they even call them windscreens. Your windscreen should be on your um, monitoring equipment, really, unless you're calibrating it. Because there's a lot of things outside of wind that can impact the, those noise measurements. So ideally, your employees are going to be used to being monitored at some point. Uh, and there's going to be, you know, an atmosphere of trust. <laughs> within your workplace. But this starts with clear explanations of what you're doing and why, and then setting the expectations of your employee. Um, you want to make sure that you, oh, I don't, I think it was still up there. Was it not? Yeah. So sorry. Okay. Um, and you got the full up? Okay. Okay, guys. So, um, you want to make sure you place that dosimeter in the hearing zone. Uh, I mentioned what it was defined by OSHA within like two feet of the head. And then once the dosimeter is deployed, don't constantly interrupt the employee. You know, that's going to uh, impact your noise measurement. Let them go on with their job and try to uh, observe it from, from a distance. And now you can typically just check that equipment with an app or um, on your computer, uh, you, can, you actually maintain a connection there. So you're able to check that. Uh, so you can just check it on. You can also check the battery life from a discrete distance. You can also take photographs to add to your report. Um, so there's something pops up and you're kind of wondering, well, I wonder what that was a result of. You might have a, a picture that could help remind you. Make sure to tech, take notes. Uh, I mentioned to not worry so much about if you have um, the correct settings applied before you go into test because modern dosimeters calculate multiple parameters uh, simultaneously to suit, you know, US or ISO configurations. So you should always have the data you need um, in a format that you need, right? Mm -hmm. And then make sure that you stop your measurement, uh, remove the dosimeter, and then uh, make sure that you calibrate. Post calibrate. Yeah. So a couple of questions. Um, should the dosimeter be left on for the entire eight hour shift? Or is that, I guess, just dependent on, on, I mean, on what you're measuring? Ideally, yes, it should. Because that's going to be uh, uh, the most defensible um, exposure measurement where you're actually able to take that you know, LEQ or L average and it's going to go all the way to the time weighted average and you're going to have the official dose. Now, if that doesn't happen... Uh, the dosimeter or well, the software will just project it out for you. Well, the, I think that you can even look at that now on your dosimeters, but it'll just project out what the likely uh, eight hour exposure would have been based on what it read previously. But yes, you should, if you can, you should. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Um, let's see. So this is just an example of some of the report reporting stuff that can come off. And I just thought it was kind of important to then be able to show you what you might be looking for because that can get kind of confusing for people. So as you flip through the different reports, and I really do imagine this is also similar across, um, you know, across brands, but you'll be able to see the standard that you selected for that measurement. And like I said, typically you're going to be able to then switch through several profiles or even, um, uh, post measurement, be able to go in and select those, maybe even customize one to see what, what would have happened. And it's going to show you your measurement time. 
it's going to show you uh, that L average or LEQ based on the um, exchange rate, like we talked about. And then it's going to tell you your dose, uh, which ends up being kind of the, so your time weighted average and your dose are going to be what are the most important aspects of compliance. And you're going to be able to see those as you move over here. So you've got your dose and you've got your eight hour um, time weighted average. And this is actually an example of where we just simply projected that out. Mm -hmm. um, this was only a nine minute measurement. Clearly that would be um, suspect, I believe. <laughs> I think OSHA sure. saw that you took a nine minute measurement. That would not be a uh, good faith effort to comply with that standard, right? Okay, so these are some of our common survey pitfalls. These are what I've seen for getting inaccurate uh, data. And so I mentioned that windscreen, how it shouldn't be called a windscreen. So one thing I've seen is the December is placed under a collar or too cl close to the employee's face or being placed without that windscreen, where then you've got interfer interference that's coming from, you know, like Justin here has a beard. If it's close enough here and he's working enough with his neck bent over, you've got beard brushing against that uh, or the collar. Um, you've got it set where the collar's coming over it. Um, I've also seen, unfortunately, where the employee either intentionally or unintentionally is going to impact the results. Uh, I've had a music teacher place her dosimeter, you know, away from the music because she thought it would cause interference. And, you know, at that point, that's my fault for not communicating effectively those employee expectations, right? Uh, we want to tell the employees what we're doing and we want to be very clear about our expectations of them. Uh, if we're not, a lot of employees can get the idea that uh, we either want them to have lower exposure or we want them to have higher exposure. Um, I've had a guy take his uh, dosimeter out on his lunch break into his car and turn the music up real loud because he thought, I don't know, maybe some sort of funding was associated with having uh, louder noise exposures. Um, he did not realize that I had it um, to take a break during his lunch break, but you know, that happens too. You'll catch people sometimes whistling or yelling into their dosimeter. Another big one is communicating the fact that you can't hear them through that. Cause I've had, you know, people try to give me a note, you know, like, Hey, uh, that was the, uh, impact drill. And I'll see that happen. And, and I have to go over and go, Hey, I can't, you know, I'm not monitoring your actual speech, right? Like we're not recording you. Um, but you'll see people whistling or yelling into those similar, same thing, trying to, for some reason, um, up those exposure levels. Uh, sometimes a person won't work where they typically would. And that's something you need to check on. Uh, or you may have selected the wrong person for a particular area. You know, if I came into even just our office here and I'm trying to get uh, some of the service guys, if I went back there, you know, I might think that our tech support um, help, it help is part of the service area. And then I might hook them up. Well, they're not moving out of their desk and they're not performing that, that service. So I've, I've made a mistake, right? So threshold distortion is what can happen when the noise levels are hovering right around the threshold and they cause that dose and time-weighted average to be artificially low. And so what you need to do is have an awareness of what is reasonable. That's why I want you to know some of those general terms and know how to use your sound level meter to, to go out and have a general idea of what is expected. So you know, when you get results, whether it matches up with your expectations so that you can figure out why. How uh, we talked about wind. I mean, the windscreens do exist for, for a reason and wind can mess you up. Uh, occasionally wind that exceeds 12 miles per hour uh, is gonna cause more sound energy than actually present. And then battery and calibration, I hope those go without saying. Um, if you don't pre and post calibrate your data, it's basically meaningless. And then uh, if you get out there and you don't have batteries, guess who's coming back for another day of uh, monitoring. So these, hopefully I've kind of touched on some as we've gone through, but uh, our customers are of course generally regulated to perform noise monitoring, but there are a lot of very good reasons to do it you're going to be able to select the appropriate hearing protection because that's dependent on knowing what your exposures are and then correctly utilizing all sorts of controls. So that's one big thing. And I don't have these really in the appropriate order. And I should have done this because I'm an industrial hygiene and I'm an industrial hygienist. And this is important. That hierarchy of controls, if you identify noise as a problem in your facility, then the first thing you want to do is try to just eliminate it, just get rid of it. And then the next thing you might want to look at is substituting, substituting something in that process for something that makes less noise. 
Then after that, you go into engineering controls. So that's that bullet there. Effective engineering controls can help reduce um, your cost and your burden uh, of everything associated with hearing loss and your hearing conservation program. And that's things like building an enclosure, um, applying those acoustic tiles, stuff like that is an effective engineering control. Then after that, you have your administrative controls where you can, uh, your workplace controls, where you can just change how people work based on uh, training and um, work practices. And then only after that, are you going to want to implement uh, the use of hearing protection, the reliance on um, your PPE? Um, because, you know, we don't, that puts a lot of burden on the employee. And um, there's oftentimes where it's not inserted correctly or not used appropriately or removed to talk to someone briefly, stuff like that. Uh, it can also allow for things like continued operations. Uh, so if you have community noise problems and you're not able to operate after a certain time, uh, if you do things to, to implement some controls to reduce that noise, you're then going to be able to extend how long you can work. Uh, also, things like improved productivity, the ability to communicate more easily. Um, of course, if you have a lot of loud things that directly impact safety, you know, uh, a forklift backing up that beeping. If you've got other noise in the surrounding area, you know, that's supposed to be a signal and it could drown out that that signal, that safety signal. Um, so I think that's a good, good point and maybe a decent stopping point. You know, I kind of rushed through some of those, but hopefully you get the gist of what could be beneficial for you. Yeah, absolutely. So are there any questions here at the end? I don't think so. I think we have a, uh, a couple that we'll follow up with um, on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, I do want to, I guess, clarify and make the point that we're not the sole, but better at the, the master U.S. distributor for this Fantech line. Um, we do have amazing you know, partners and distributors that help us um, all throughout the United States. Um, and then also along after this webinar, we'll be sending up a follow-up email, mm -hmm. and it will include all these uh, slides that Dr. Lynch um, just went through. So you guys feel free to use that, you know, at your own um, organizations and such to, um, you know, to train your people. And then obviously feel free to, to reach out to, to us here at OHD if we can, you know, uh, and help you with enhancing your noise protection program. If you're interested in this Fantech, um, you know, noise and vibration analyzers or, or anything like that. So anything else you'd like to add, Dr. Lynch? Yeah, if you have just um, questions about your own you know, personal situation and it's not stuff that you want to direct towards the, the sales arena, then feel free to reach out to me. I should have put my personal one up here, but it's slinch at ohdglobal.com. And you can feel free to uh, you know, just uh, knock around some ideas or if you have any extra questions. And I'm sure I'll be the one following up with anyone who did have anything. So thank you so much. Right. for yeah. your time. Thank you all for your time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.